Hello, everyone, and welcome to Nails and Beauty Talk. I am your host, Asia the Bird. To have a very special guest with us today, he is a coach influencer at Coach in New York City. Please welcome Aaron. Hello, Aaron, and welcome. Hi there. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, absolutely. I want to go ahead and get started by asking where you're originally from and tell us a little about your upbringing. Yeah, of course. So I'm originally from Miami, um, and I lived there for most of my life, actually. Um, mm -hmm. And I lived there for probably like, oh God, most of my childhood. Um, growing up, I kind of pinballed around the world a little bit. So I lived in Miami for a little bit. Um, then I moved to Jersey. And then I even lived in Colombia for three years, which is where my family was originally from. So mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm very used to change and kind of like going from here to there. So yeah, that was that was definitely a good time. Yeah, it's really, really cool. So what was mm -hmm. like your school experience like? Like, you know, grade school, college, things like that. So I would say in Miami, I mean, I mostly just went to like elementary school and high school. My high school experience was pretty interesting, though. So I started high school actually in Jersey. Mm. And then I went to like this private school in Columbia. Um, originally in, in New Jersey, it was like this very typical suburban, you know, high school, which is, you know, everything that you would imagine a high school would be with the football field and, you know, the cheerleaders right. and the jocks and the lockers and the lunchroom, all that. Mm -hmm. And then when I moved to Colombia, my high school over there, um, it was like in a mountain and they had cows mm -hmm. like just grazing. Like <laughs> I remember, you know, like I'm walking to fourth period and there's like this, you know, 1300 pound like mammal just like eating grass. And I'm like, oh, my God. I'm like, OK, it's definitely different than what I'm used to. But mm -hmm. uh, it was a cool experience. It was definitely very different. And then I ended up uh, moving back to Miami and I finished um high school there. And that's eventually where I actually um, started a coach while mm. I was at school. Mm -hmm. That's really, really cool. Now, who did you consider to be like your role models growing up? So I would definitely say my mom and my older brother were the two main people that I looked up to the most. Um, my mom, just because she, I feel like she instilled like really good values and um, myself and my siblings as well. And then my older brother, because he was like the movie buff and he, he would, you know, he would be the first to like, to show me like, you know, whatever like viral meme was going around and like oh, right. movies and stuff. And a lot of these movies and like the costumes and the coutures and all like the beauty that I would see in them. Some of these films is actually kind of what also mm -hmm. kickstarted my, um, my career in um, fashion. Mm, yeah, it's really, really cool. So you work at Coach House as a coach influencer in New York City. So what are some of the things you like about the brand Coach? Yeah, so I feel like Coach, at least in recent years, has been moving in a very different direction. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, at least this is like what I've been through conversations, what I've heard from other people as well. Um, there's almost like a youthful energy that's kind of being infused into the brand while still kind of like maintaining the heritage of everything. I like how it's very... I feel like it's laid back. It doesn't feel very stuffy, um, which is something you could kind of feel in other mm -hmm. luxury brands. It can feel like a little uppity and whatnot. Um, I feel like it's, it's cool now. It's youthful. The campaigns are, I feel like they're empowering. Um, and the, the overall vibe is just very, very comforting. And mm -hmm. the collections are cool. Mm. Yeah, right. Absolutely. So as a coach influencer, you work with social media, uh, the social media team to produce content for the brand. So as far as branding and making content, what will be some of like your tips as far as creating fashion content? So I think what I do, at least, is that I take the time to brainstorm mm -hmm. and I constantly look at my surroundings, at least in New York City, that's so like, he like heavily fashion inspired, whether it be on the train, mm -hmm. I'm always studying the streets and looking what people are wearing. Um, mm -hmm. And I, this is usually where I draw my inspiration from. So if I see somebody right. that's wearing something cool, cool color combination, or you know they styled something in an interesting way, then I kind of take that and then I brainstorm around that. Right. Kind of think of content that could be relevant um, to the brand but then also that's in line with our business goals, which is something that I also need to keep in mind. So mm -hmm. I think just consistently brainstorming and employing your creative mm -hmm. part of your brain 
is important and not to look too much, don't draw too much inspiration from other influencers, I would say, um, and just kind of try to really be as original as possible. And I know that sounds super cliche, but mm -hmm. I feel like that with practice, um, eventually that creativity becomes stronger and mm -hmm. then you come up with things that other people haven't done before, which ultimately leads to your success. Cause why do what everything, what everybody else is doing? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, right. Absolutely, most definitely. So mm -hmm. what I love about you as well is, you know, you love like handbags and you talk about different handbags, things like that. Um, me and my mom love handbags, especially like the coach one. So in your perspective, yes. number one, what is what makes coach handbags so unique, but also what is like some of your favorite coach handbags? So what I feel makes the bags really unique a lot of the times is we have really cool silhouettes. Um, mm -hmm. And if you'll notice, there's kind of like, there's like the, like the swinger is kind of like, a, it's kind of like a curved bag. And we have like the Soho right. bag, which is also kind of like, you know, there's also different house codes that coach has um, mm -hmm. that people Sometimes they might not know exactly what it is, but they can identify that bag as a coach bag. So there's right. different details, like a little hang tag, um, which comes with every single coach bag. Right. So hardware is another thing that we're really big on. Mm -hmm. um, the, the coach signature C like print that we've done in like a million different ways. So mm -hmm. those house codes, I think is what makes those bags unique. Also the materials that we utilize were very leather focused. We've always been that way. Mm -hmm. So anyone who has like vintage coach bags, they know that they will like, they will outlive you. You can throw that thing around for 30 years and it can, it'll, and it'll look fine. Um, right. And that's not really something that everybody can say. Um, but here is like, you're definitely getting like a bang for your buck. And also they're, they're pretty bags. They're pretty classic silhouettes mm -hmm. that um, a lot of other brands have actually drawn inspiration from. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And the thing that I really notice about what Coach and other brands are doing is very that nostalgia. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So especially with Coach, like it has that Y2K or late 90s type of feel with some of the handbags, right. you know, like the clutches and, mm. you know, like the heart. I love the heart, um, Coach's heart bags and stuff like that. And I love how with Coach, they not only play with leather, but they also play with different textures, like a puffed effect with the C yes. logo, you know, or a matte effect and things like that. So I love like with Coach that they're playing with different textures. Mm -hmm. No, definitely, definitely. And to kind of draw from that point that you made earlier about like that kind of leveraging that feeling of nostalgia, uh, a lot of people, the coach bags that they own when they come in store, uh, they oftentimes have a story connected to it. And mm. people say, oh, this this was my grandma's bag. It was my first bag or my first designer bag was a coach bag. Um, this mm -hmm. was my mom's bag that she got you know, in high school and she gave it to me. So we've kind of mm -hmm. created kind of like this culture um, to kind of have like legacy bags that we just kind of pass on and, right. pass, on and pass on, right? And yeah and kind of leveraging and tapping into that nostalgia, which I think is smart. We actually have done like revamps and relaunches of bags from previous years. For example, like the Soho bag that launched in mm -hmm. 2006. We came out with it again this year in uh, different mm -hmm. colorways, um, you know, with some additional details. And then the Demi bag that uh, launched originally in 2003, we came back with it too. And then mm -hmm. even if you take a look at the campaigns, a lot of the styling is very Y2K focused too. So. Um, mm -hmm clearly there's people who are doing their research and realizing, you know, Gen Z is into the whole Y2K trend, right. and that whole revamp. So we're going to leverage that and mm -hmm. we're going to, you know, revamp this collection at a relatively accessible price point and mm -hmm. try to appeal to that, um, to that generation and that consumer. Mm, absolutely. And what I love about there was one video that I seen in the um the coach's TikTok where you review the the chain bag. Yeah. And what I like about also as well with coach is that there's multiple ways you can utilize that handbag, you know, but also the chain as well. So I like how you use it as like a chain for your yeah. pants and then like you know the chain for your necklace and things like that. So I like how it's a play with you know using it for multiple things. Yeah, no, for sure. And then I think another thing that makes um, our bag so unique is our versatility as, as mm -hmm. well. So there are really oh, many, many different ways that you can style one bag and reconfigure it and make it um, 
make one bag look like a bunch of different ones, which is great because what happens is that you're getting one product, but you're really extracting as much like um, as much goodness as you can from it, right? So we're also mm -hmm. like encouraging you to buy good products of good quality, but at the same time to employ your creativity a little bit and that inner right. stylist and kind of like make it new. So that's where kind of like my role comes in as an influencer to kind of give our audience or that consumer that inspiration that, hey, you know, this is a chain that we would, you know, conventionally we just use it as a strap, but you can make it into a wristlet. You can use it as a necklace, like showing mm -hmm. these different ways that you can employ just one thing, mm -hmm. I think is, um, I think is also what, what adds on to the, to the creativity and the uniqueness that is, uh, that are coach bags. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the thing is, I like what you said is that like handbags can be like passed down. Like, you know, if you have a certain like a unique model of a handbag, you can mm -hmm. pass it down. And, you know, there are some uh, coach bags that, you know, my my mom passed down to me and my mom owns like a, owns a few um, coach bags. And one of the bags I like from um, my mom's like, you know, some of the handbags that she has is like the mm. denim. It's like these different types of denim. There's like blue mm. flowers and things like that. And I just love like there again with coach. You know, it's like the play on with texture and things like that, you know, right. like the leather, the denim, you know, the hardware, you know, and things like that. So it's very, very cool. Yeah, totally. And I know previously you asked me like what my favorite bags are. So <clears throat> I actually have her right here in front of me. So there's this, we have a made to order service at the store. So okay. you get to design your own bag. You get to choose the colors. You get to choose the hardware. So earlier this year, I made my own bag. Ooh. And I, my favorite color is yellow, and I want to do an all yellow bag. So I did a custom Rogue 25 in Ooh, all yellow. That's nice. That's really yeah. nice. So even like the interior is in like yellow as well. Um, it has like polished brass hardware. And one of the things I really love about it is, well, number one, the color, and number two, no one else has it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if people are like, if they ask me like um, about my bag in the studio, they're like, oh my God, your bag's so cute. And I'm like, well, Thank you. And they're like, would you get it? And I'm like, ah, well, <laughs> I got it custom made. Um, <laughs> so it's a little bit of air of like, you know, you can be a little pretentious there. Cause I'm like, listen, if I drop the coin, I might as well, you know, let them know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And like the thing with, with handbags, I like, you know, designing, like, you know, I'm an artist. I love to paint and do nails and things like that. Yeah, there was yeah. one bag um, that I did and my mom has had this coach bag for a long time. It's like a, a, a tote bag, I think. Mm -hmm. And so this is like, hold on. Ooh, that's fabulous. That looks like a, a vintage duffel is the, is the name of that bag. I love it. It's beautiful. Yeah, a vintage duffel. So that's mm -hmm. the handbag um, I designed for, it was like for Mother's Day. And there's like okay. another handbag um, that she's got. It's like from Burberry. And mm -hmm. it's, I think it's like the last one. And it was like the last one in the world. And then it's like a, a big, like, you know, handbag. Mm -hmm. Ooh, look at that. I love the straps on it. That's so nice. All right, Burberry, okay. <laughs> Listen, I got a good credit where credit is due. Yeah, yeah. So that's so that's um the Burberry bag, like, and it and it's really really cool. I love the design of it. It's really really cool. Right. Um, another thing that's another thing that's also in too is um another thing that's also in too is the trunk bags as well, mm -hmm. and I got my first um trunk bag from uh Brandon Blackwood. He's a black designer, yeah. right. and so yeah. I got it in white, and this is um mm -hmm. and systemic racism. Mm hmm. Yeah, so, and that handbag, like this handbag, I think is what really put his brand on the map. Yeah, I like, yeah. I, it's a very like, it's a very simple silhouette too. So, right. I mean, it, you can really dress it up or dress it down. Mm -hmm. And also like, obviously like the, the message that it has as well, it's it's impactful. Um, and that's like, I remember also seeing that bag like first and like no one else is really doing that. Right. Mm -hmm. Right, so that yeah. was really, really cool. Yeah, absolutely. Now, also another thing <laughs> that I like with Coach is the sneakers, mm -hmm. and so yeah. I got a pair of the Coach sneakers. So these are the sneakers that I got. Okay, yeah, the high yeah, tops. I'm a, huge, I'm a huge sneaker sneaker head, so I was Those like, "Yo, I want to get these." <laughs> yeah, we've done a couple of cool high tops lately. Um, we did like a distressed version for our runway show. I want to say one or two seasons ago. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, we got when we got those in the store, I really like them. And they're actually like really comfortable too. Yeah, yeah, right. Absolutely, most definitely. So I mm-hmm. want to get into as far as fall winter trends as far as handbags. Now, what do you think yeah. are some of the trends as far as handbags for fall and winter season? So one of the big trends I've been seeing lately is sheer link or fur bags. Um or anything that's like really texture heavy. So I know at the store we released a collection previously that's like a patchwork shearling jacket and it's in a couple of different colors for, um, it's just like one bag and has like a patchwork of like maybe like primary colors, a couple of different browns, beiges. So that textural element um, that shearling kind of lends to a bag is something that I've definitely seen a lot of um, Mm -hmm. in the store as well as um, in the street. Also, I've noticed like this like slouchy bag look, right? Mm-hmm. Um, in materials like pebble leather or like a soft suede, it's kind of like buttery and it just kind of looks like a like a very um, casual kind of laid back feel. Kind of like uh, like this bag has a little bit of like kind of like that slouchiness to it. Yeah, right. So like so I've seen a lot of people wear like heavy knitted um, tops with like a very like slouchy bag, and it's just a really cool, mm-hmm. effortless look. Um, and actually, you know what? If this is something refreshing that I've seen that, you know, fall typically we associate it with like earth tones and like dark chocolatey colors and like right. black, right? The winter. I've seen a lot of people coming out now with like really bright pops of color for right. the fall. So like a bright green, like a fuchsia, which is which are mm-hmm. typically colors that we associate with like a spring or summer. But I like yeah. it because, um, you know, Sometimes fall and winter can be a very like bleak time of the year. It's just like not sunny and it's not like, you know, beautiful outside. So right. when someone's like out there wearing like, you know, really bright, fun colors and like accessories like that, I think mm-hmm. it adds a really nice refreshing touch to an outfit and it can elevate a look for sure. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Another thing that I find very, very cool is with the handbags is, is there again, that Y2K feel with yeah. the handbags. But what I like also too, that certain brands are doing is playing with, like the curvature of mm-hmm. the hand, especially at the bottom, you know. So I've seen like you know certain brands, you know, play with that whole thing with the purse that has that that arch at the bottom, yeah. you know, it can stand <clears throat> up. So that's really really mm-hmm. cool as well. Yeah, no, I love it, and I think one last trend that I really love are the micro bags. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the mini. Um, the mini mini like the mini 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 micro yeah, bags. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. The one that you can literally fit like maybe like like a chapstick, your keys and like a credit card and that's it. Um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> I remember maybe ooh, maybe like a year or two years ago, um, Lizzo had her red carpet moment with this tiny bag. It was like probably like this big. The bags <laughs> I'm talking about are not that small, but ever since I saw that, I was like, I was like, I'm obsessed. I thought it was iconic. <laughs> but now everybody wants to have their Lizzo moment. And I'm like, you guys can go ahead and have that. Uh, at least at the store, we have a couple of different um, couple different silhouettes in that like tiny bag uh, kind of trend. But in reality, right. honestly, what I like about it is it kind of like forces you to kind of reduce the amount of things that you carry. And mm-hmm. just it boils it down to like the very like elemental, like basic, basic, basic necessities. And you realize mm-hmm. like, you know what? I can just go out with like my phone, my credit card and keys and I'm good. Like I don't really need any, anything mm-hmm. else, you know, or like my Metro card. Mm-hmm. So it kind of like forces you to kind of like downsize a little bit. And then you realize that you don't really need too much. So I think that's another like uh, upside of that trend too. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Most definitely. Yeah, I mm-hmm. totally agree with that. So when it comes down to fashion style, you know, pe- yeah. there are some individuals that are about the labels. There are some that are able to take certain pieces, mm-hmm. you know, you know, whether it's thrifting, you know, finding different pieces from unique stores, um, small boutiques, and, you know, yeah. make a unique look. And we're in a time of in our generation where it's all about being seen. It's all about being unique as, as much as possible. Mm-hmm. So as far as your style, how did you find your style over time? So the way that I found my style, ever since I was very, very small, um, you know, I grew up with rather limited means. So I didn't really have access to like, I couldn't go to you know, Abercrombie and Fitch and like get the hoodies that my classmates had or whatever it was. But I always remember right. that I would go into my mom's closet and I would like look at her things. And it was always like, it always sparked like a curiosity in me. 
And a lot of the times mm -hmm. the clothes that I had were hand-me-downs, um, mm -hmm. either from like family friends or from my brother. And they didn't, they weren't really my style, but right. you know, as they, as Mariah Carey said in that one really drunk video, she's like, I'm gonna do the best I can with what I got. <laughs> so, so I was like, you know what? We're gonna take these graphic tees, we're gonna cut them up. Um, I'm gonna take these jeans and I'm gonna make them interesting. And really right. I had to employ my creativity and really work with what I had in order to kind of like tailor things to my aesthetic, which I just kind of gradually found and experimented with different looks. There was a period of time where I was very preppy. There was a period of time I was very minimalist. There was a period of time in which I was like very like streetwear heavy or I was very inspired by like, you know, vintage looks, so that's what I would go for. So right. as time went on, um, at least through childhood, kind of learning to really work with what I had and try to be as creative as possible to like create a look that was unique to me. Um, mm -hmm. As I got older, it made me appreciate more the resources that I currently have that I can go out and I can buy things that I actually enjoy. Right. So mm -hmm. um, over time, um, moving from place to place, as I've moved so many times and I've seen so many different kinds of people and um, different ways of dressing, because I do feel like fashion and the way what you put on in the morning and the way you dress is one of your main forms of self-expression, because it's the first thing right. that people see. So mm -hmm. for me, I being aware of that, I, I tend to st study people a lot. Right. Mm -hmm. and drawing inspiration from that. I also applied it to my own wardrobe um, and also consuming uh, fashion-related uh, content, um, whether it be on TikTok, on Instagram, mm -hmm. and then kind of experimenting with that. Uh, gradually, my style um, developed mm -hmm. into something else, and it's continuing to develop, too. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing with, with fashion is that it's, it's an evolution thing, you know, especially when you find your own style. You know right. what I mean? You're always, you know, evolving and changing things about, you know, how you like to dress and things like that. And what I noticed with, you know, with fashion also, as well as like with the nail industry, like the nail industry, you know, is an, is another aspect of self-expression because people get their nails done. And, you know, that's, an, that's another thing, you know, not just with the outfit itself, but the nails mm -hmm. also as well, you know, people look at, you know, like, oh, who, who did your nail? Like so-and-so did them and things like that, you know, um, so it's really, really cool to really see how different trends recycle. You know what I mean? Right. So it's like, you know, it comes and it goes. It comes and it goes. You know, it's weird how that happens. But, mm -hmm. you know, I just like the the Y2K thing that people are on now, like how we, we were mentioning a few times before, you know, it's, it's just that looking back to those previous styles like from the 70s, 80s, right. 90s, and things like that. So people are really drawing references to those eras. So that's what I like about fashion now and where it's going. Right. And I feel like another thing that's kind of like shaped my style over time is also understanding my role as a consumer and how I can be responsible as a consumer. So mm -hmm. rather than going for, you know, overly trendy pieces, maybe bearing in mind that, you know, there are certain uh, trends that are recycled and there are things that are coming back and buying pieces that I know that 10, five or 10 years from now, I will still be able to love and enjoy and making that mm -hmm. conscious decision. Um, and looking through that kind of like that responsible consumer lens as I browse and shop um, mm -hmm. has, has definitely also helped me uh, gradually evolve into what my style is today. Mm, absolutely. And another thing too, like how I've learned to develop my style was from my dad. I learned about, mm. you know, how to dress from my dad and things like that, of how to pick certain pieces, you know. And, you know, sometimes we go to Macy's and, and he'll tell me like, you know, hit the clearance rack. You know, because right. I mean? there's some good pieces in the clearance rack. You know, you don't have to buy full priced um, pieces and things like that. You know, I got good. this. I got this at the Macy's last act uh, <laughs> rack over there in Florida. I paid like, what, like $70 for this? I was like, it's a triple XL. I'm like, give it to me. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. Or there's like pieces that, you know, your parents or your friends don't want and they give it to you and you style in your own type of way. Yeah. So that's another thing, too. Yeah, because I feel like it's very, very easy um you know to go online or there's like a catalog or a magazine and you see an outfit and you just kind of like draw inspiration from that and just kind of get the whole look from head to toe but mm -hmm. especially when you grow up right with limited means and you really need to learn how to make something work mm -hmm. even when you're given those pieces that you're kind of like 
you're like, I don't know if this is like really for me, but you know what? We're going to see what happens. And then you end right. up loving it because there's exactly. so many times that I gifted something or I find something in a store, like at a thrift store. And I'm like, this is so tacky. I love it. I'm going to take it. Let's go. <laughs> you know what I mean? Kind of like yeah. stepping out of your comfort zone, just kind of like baby steps at a time and just being like, you know what? Let me take these little risks and I'm going to work with it. And then, you know, gradually it'll, your style will evolve into something else. And then one day you maybe not want them, might, might not want it anymore. And then you hand it to somebody else who's going to have the same set of challenges, you know? Mm, absolutely. So where are like your go-to accessories you can't live without? Um, of course, number one is my handbags. <laughs> I a handbag. I was reading an article the other day that said, um, you know, why handbag isn't like a, um, like Anna Winter doesn't wear handbags or whatever because it's not like a real part of an outfit or like you know we shouldn't like incorporate it and in, like to put an outfit together it shouldn't require a bag and I'm like Anna Winter can do whatever she's doing I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna do me <laughs> and I feel like right. my bag is an integral part of my outfit and a lot of the times it can be the glue that just kind of puts everything together mm. so number one handbag for sure number two a pair of sunglasses mm. I. It's funny because growing up, uh, I remember a lot of my classmates or people around me, they would wear glasses, right? And mm. sometimes people would have like these cool, funky shades, kind of like what you got going on, which I love. And I was like, oh my God, it's face jewelry. And since I right. can't, I mean, since I have, I have, my vision is fine and I'm like, I can't wear glasses. I'm like, I'm gonna get some funky right. sunglasses and we're gonna just kind of like put a little face jewelry on there. So I think that's another silhouette. And I mean, another accessory that is like indispensable in my wardrobe at least. Mm -hmm. And I also, I don't want to burn my retinas, right? Because the sun is very real. <laughs> so, right, right. Uh, yeah, so sunglasses are definitely important. And if any, if you see me at night anywhere in New York, I'm probably wearing sunglasses. It's I, I look ridiculous, <laughs> but I don't care. On the subway at like three in the morning, I got sunglasses on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, exactly. I want to get into as far as your favorite handbags, even a top five list of your favorite handbags and what they'd be and why. Top five, top five, top five. Okay. Mm. Number one, I would say is, maybe it's a little bit biased, but I'm like, well, whatever. Uh, is the Rogue bags, the Rogue silhouettes at Coach, uh, which is the, the silhouette that I got my custom bag in. Mm -hmm. um, very classic top handle. You can wear it in three different ways. It's super versatile. And it's, I think, one of the most functional bags that I have um, in my collection. Um, there's an alligator skin one at the store. It's like eight right. grand. It's, oh my God. It's like this deep green. It's like almost like swamp queen realness. I'm like, I want, like, I want it so bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that's number one. Number two, I would say the little Paco Rabanne, um, little chain clutches. I don't know if you've seen them with like little interlinks on them. And sometimes mm -hmm. they have like these, like these like big crystals on them. I think it's like, mm -hmm. it's so timeless. It's like so futuristic, very like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, like it's kind of like that futuristic sixties, like look, you know what I mean? Right, right. Like it looks like it looks at, like it belongs in like in the scream video with like Michael Jackson on the lake and Janet on the spaceship. <laughs> I'm, like, that's the kind of bag they will be wearing. I've always been obsessed with that bag. I love it. Um, I think thirdly, it would probably be the, I think it's called the Papillon bag from Louis Vuitton. It's like this mm -hmm. um, barrel bag, right? And there's this one in like blue epi leather, which is a material I don't think they do anymore. And it's like this barrel bag and it has like, it's like a little shoulder bag. Mm -hmm. And I love an interesting silhouette with, um, with my accessories. So barrel bags are like one of my favorites. I really, really love them. I think it lends like a cool sculptural kind of like effect to um, to a look. And I don't mm -hmm. know, it like adds a little bit of dimension in there. Do you know what I mean? Right. Yeah, so I, I definitely love that one. Um, let me think, there is this one bag I saw at Bottega the other day that was like, it was like interweaved, but it was like huge and it had like this like, this big like metal ball, like closure crazy crazy, mm. crazy 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 it's probably um like six six months worth of rent for me wow <laughs> but it's, yeah no it's crazy oh it's crazy yeah, expensive. Yeah, yeah. but mm. it's absolutely gorgeous my last bag and best for last is probably gonna surprise you it is my mcnally jackson bookstore canvas tote mm. that i just got with my book membership 
<laughs> and it's like the canvas toe tread that everyone like, you know, it's like the, I guess it's like um, a Gen Z thing, like having like a little ice latte with like the canvas toe. <laughs> But I legitimately love it because it's one of the bags that I use the most. Because like when I need to throw things like in there and just like run out the door, it's the best. And I feel like New Yorkers have a very cool way of just having really cool staple pieces right. um, mm -hmm. in their wardrobe and putting them randomly together with like a canvas tote. And it's like this super, they just look super badass. Mm -hmm. and fashionable and it's just like with like little canvas toe and listen like they might have a fantastic 401k all right you know they're like have litigation at three and that they have a brunch with tom ford at like whatever time and they have like a little canvas toe on so it's like right. i feel like it kind of like lends out like yeah like i'm so cool i can wear a canvas toe and still make it look fly mm -hmm. so i love that vibe so that's definitely one of my favorite bags too Mm, yeah, it's really, really cool. I think some bags of, of my favorite are like, you know, Brandon Blackwood's. Um, mm -hmm. He had a, he just released a metal uh, trunk bag, you know, mm -hmm. and that's really, really cool. Um, I love also Brandon Blackwood's and systemic racism <laughs> um, trunk bag as well. Mm -hmm. um, th that's really, really cool. Um, I think Jacquemus, um, which is a fashion brand, I think they had like many, the many, many bags. I like his yeah. bags um, as well. Um, another and bag I really like is there's this brand called um, Rare Romance, mm -hmm. and they do like the they have this black bag that's like three hundred something dollars, and it's like a it's like a rectangular like bag, and it, it it plays a thing with shape, and it has like an angle at the bottom, so it's really really cool. It has like a a small you know handle you can carry and things like that. Um, I would say my last one is the Coach bag. I think Coach had like a puff um fur like faux fur um type of handbag that, that uh, mm. coach was, i think is either is either that one or the um puffy bag that coach mm. released as well yes the pillow tabby that's the mm. one that like really put us on the map um like really like, revamped us mm. yeah the pillow tabby is really really cool i want to also get into as far as designers if you had a top five list of your favorite designers who would they be and why let me think i number one um, it, for me, apart from just her work, also like their persona and the personality that comes with her, I think is iconic. Um, number one would be Donatella Versace. Mm -hmm. So I feel like being one of like the main like women designers in the industry, who's like a big name and has been kind of like carrying her brother's legacy for the last 30 and something years. She yeah. has been consistently putting out beautiful, just beautiful clothes that sell well. Right. And she, she, has, they have, she has a very distinct style and brand DNA that's just so like quintessentially just like extravagant Italian. Right. She's just like, she's like stuck to that and has been mm -hmm. able to kind of reinterpret it throughout the years and just seeing the way the brand has evolved, but it's still, you know, paying homage to what her brother did and what they did collectively. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Doing something like that and just being that creative over that such a long period of time and being able to do it consistently is something like really admirable, but mm -hmm. just like her whole look, like the platinum blonde hair, like the deep, like smoky eyes and like in the lips and just like the, you know, you know what I mean? It's the whole, mm -hmm vibe about her is like it, it's captivating um the accent it's just like it's just she's so she's just fab like in, her <laughs> vogue, like in the vogue 70 questions then she's like he was like how would you describe your personal style she's like eh, very personal and i'm like ah but i'm like i'm like i'm like oh my god you know what i mean like everyone's right. like, hey. <laughs> like everyone like clap you know like everyone clap everyone clap um yeah she's one of my favorite designers i also really like Ralph simmons Mm. Particularly, one of my favorite, I think, like, 10 years he's had at a brand was his time at Calvin Klein. Mm. I thought he was just like, oh, my God, it was beautiful. Mm. Because I remember when that collection came out, there was just, like, so many, like, chunky knits. And it was just, like, this really cool, fresh energy to the brand. Right. Um, and it was just like, so it was like really American too. Mm -hmm. and the whole Western vibe that it had to it, like those iconic cowboy boots that it came out with, right. the pop culture references, Brooke Shields, Andy Warhol. I'm very big into all of that. 
So the way he kind of like tapped into it and, you know, infused it into the brand, but also his way of designing is rather minimal, which is kind of in line with the way I like to dress too, because my style is sometimes I could be a little extravagant, but for the mm -hmm. most part, I feel like having really solid pieces that kind of like speak for themselves mm -hmm. uh, without having to like heavily accessorize mm -hmm. is a direct indication that it's like a well-designed piece, if that makes right. sense. So Raph is another big one for me. Um, let me think. The designer I really like, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Um, he was the, the short Parisian guy that passed away a couple of years ago. His brand is called Alaya. Um, hmm. Oh my God, I can't remember. Anyway. In any case, it, the, it's a French name, and I don't know how to, I don't know how to pronounce that. It's like, it's Maison Alaya, something like that. Okay. But in any case, when I study uh, the clothes that he makes, they're just so, they're sculptural, number one. They're super right. flattering. And I feel like a lot of the times designers uh, kind of like lose touch of what designing is really all about. Um, it's the art of designing clothes, but it's also the art of selling clothes. Do you know what mm. I mean? feel like a lot of the pieces that he makes are for that for, for that end it's to sell and things you know how you can have a concept in your mind that at the end of the day you want to have a product that's going to be um it's going to appeal to your consumers and i think he does that very well and it's he knows how to make people look good so mm -hmm. that's another uh, admire a uh, designer i really admire dior of course iconic mm -hmm. uh, the silhouettes just like he's like the blueprint for a lot of people, a lot, a lot of people. Um, mm -hmm. And then lastly, I think Bonnie Cashin. She was the first woman woman director for um, handbags and accessories at Coach back in the '60s. So she was mm. like one of the for like one of the first like big, big like heavy hitter, um, well, woman designers at the time. And a lot of the things that you see currently at Coach today um, were inspired by a lot of the work that she did. So mm. kind of like goes to show that, you know, even though she did this stuff maybe 50, 60 years ago, um, right. it's still, it was just, it was really timeless. A lot of the silhouettes mm -hmm. that she did, a little turn lock detail that you see on coach bags. Um, it's like this like little thing that you kind of turn and like you flap it open. Right. So that was a originally, which I thought was very smart from her part. Um, it was inspired by the kind of like hood flap on her convertible that you kind of like would twist open. And she kind of wanted to incorporate that kind of utilitarian feature of that mm -hmm. into the handbags to make them more functional. So it's like a little bit of like engineering that she also kind of like incorporated into her designs, which mm -hmm. I thought was great because now, you know, even nowadays there's brands that also do the turn lock, but we were the first to do it. And it all started with Bonnie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really, really cool. I would say my top five is number one, Alexander McQueen, because I love- all right. Like you know, some of his um, runway shows like in the early 2000s and, mm. you know, early 2010s, you know, and what's so iconic about Alexander McQueen is that not only did his work tell a story, but it was pushing the boundaries as far as fashion. And, you know, I liked how he played with texture and shape and things of that nature, especially mm. with the, the heels. There was a pair of heels from Alexander McQueen that Lady Gaga wore in um, Bad Romance. It's like this Ooh, gold. The armadillo style. ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the armadillo ones. Yeah, right, exactly. So I like Alexander McQueen and just, you know, the, the legacy that he's left as far as the standard of fashion, you know, is, mm. is really, was really, really cool. You know what I mean? Um, God rest his soul. Um, another designer, um, God rest his soul as well, is Terry Mugler. Mm -hmm. He's a French designer. And his work in the mid, late 90s, his work was phenomenal. Like his work is very au couture, very out the box. I loved how Terry Mugler played a lot with texture and design using different, you know, pieces to make a cool, you know, uh, to make a cool gown or dress. And one of my favorite looks from Terry Mugler is the La Chimere, which is like mm -hmm. a very colorful, like rainbow gown. And it has like, you know, it's, it comes with a headdress that stuff coming out, you know, it's like, fish, you know, fish fins or something like that. So, you know, Terry Mugler is also a very remarkable uh, designer. Um, another designer I really like is Guo Pei, and she's a Chinese designer, and her stuff is also very au couture, very, very out the box. Um, mm -hmm. I love how she's in connection with her Chinese culture, 
And I love how it's just the silhouettes are so unique and so very, very cool. Um, I really, really enjoy looking at a lot of her work. Another um, design I'll say is Iris Van Herpen. Mm -hmm. and he does a lot of 3D printing, um, fashion. Um, you know, her stuff is very, very iconic, very, very cool. Um, and last but not least, I would, I would really, really say Patrick Kelly. Um, he's a black designer, um, God rest his soul as well. Um, he's, he was a very remarkable um, fashion designer. Um, he's from Mississippi. And um, his work was very colorful, very playful. Um, I love how he played with buttons and designed in different ways, you know, with the, with his silhouettes. Um, I just love like his work of how very playful it was. So those are my top five. Which brings, you know what, now that you mentioned that, it reminds me, one of my favorite designers currently is Christopher John Rogers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I it, the the way he's like consistently able to kind of like play with patterns and silhouettes in like such a cool refreshing way um, is mm -hmm. is really inspiring. And if you notice, a lot of his collections are really not over accessorized. Right. It's mm -hmm. just like it's it, it plainly the look plainly relies on just expert tailoring and just good design. It's mm -hmm. just when, when you see his collections, they're just like really solidly well-designed, beautiful silhouettes that don't need like a bag. They don't need the shoes. They don't need like a clunky necklace. And I feel like a lot of the times um, mm -hmm. people try to compensate for okay design by styling, which is fine because sometimes that's just good. There's different markets and different consumers. But um, in the context of what he makes in particular, just the dress alone with like simple little earrings is just mm -hmm. a beautiful look from head to toe. And I feel like that's a direct indication of something that's well designed and well made. Mm, yeah, I totally agree. I love like his silhouettes. I love like, you know, yeah, like how you said the tailoring, you know, mm -hmm. the tailoring was really, really well, well made and things like that. And I also, um, another, one of the collections I like from Alexander McQueen was like the right to wear, I think like fall, winter, I believe. And I liked how with the, um, that collection in particular, I love the tailoring with like the coats, mm. the suits and the dresses and things like that. Um, you know, it, it was very Alexander McQueen, but it was like in, in the aspect of being about tailoring. It wasn't about being mm. so over the top and doing so, like having so much texture and things like that. Like sometimes simplicity, you know, says a lot, you know, sometimes less is best. So I like with certain runway shows when they make us a, a nice tailored suit or like a nice tailored dress, you know, um, and in a collection like you know that's simp then simplicity and the tailoring is stellar. Um, another designer I really like is Laquan Smith. Laquan, Ooh, yes. Smith, you know his garments is very very cool. Um, I like how you know it's it's sexy and it's edgy and things like that. Um, so I like how you know he he plays with that aspect. You know like the sexiness and the edginess, the chic. You know, so I like a lot of his work as well. Yeah, no, totally. And I feel like for me, one of the best ways to kind of really assess whether a collection is good or not, or a work, a designer's work is mm -hmm. just kind of by, you know, it's like stripping a tree of all its leaves and just having like the most elemental things, right? Just like mm -hmm. down to the bare bones, like what the garments look like stand alone. On themselves mm -hmm. is it something original is it something that's going to work with other garments or is it heavily relying on styling and other pieces in order to make it good in of itself do you know what i mean mm -hmm. so a lot of the designers that i just mentioned i feel like they are able to kind of pass that test and you know strip away the glamour and strip away you know the makeup and the model and like the shows and the lights and the, same, and the things and you're just objectively and strictly looking at the clothing that they make it's beautiful they're just beautiful pieces and there's just well thought out, well designed collections. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with that. So, I would like to talk about um, design runway shows. If you had a top three list as far as you know, uh, runway fashion design runway shows you would go to, what, what would it be? Mm -hmm. I would love to go to. <laughs> it's, this is going to be funny. I I want to go to Balenciaga show. I'm going to tell you why, because it's just like. It's just, it's so weird a lot of times. <laughs> it's not like, it's like I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't go there to purchase anything or like really, I'm, I'm not really going there for the clothes because I feel like it's become something else. It's just like, it's just mm -hmm. so 
odd. <laughs> I'd like, you know, see like uh, runway yeah. models like hunched over and like, you know, rocking like this um, <laughs> down a runway. I'm like, I mean, you have to see it once in your life. You know what I mean? It's like, right. it's like you got to go to New York at least once or like, you know, anyway. I feel like that's what that's one show I'd really love to go to because I think that's like really cool. Um, mm. Yeah, it'll just it's, it gives me an excuse to like wear something weird. Like they had a show at the New York Stock Exchange, and like they were like walking around with like papers everywhere, and I'm like, I'm like this is crazy. Sign me up. Let's go. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right, um, right. I, I think it, I think it's really really fun. Um, I would like to go also to like a Dior show. Mm. I feel like, you know, that's where all the the celebrities are at. Um, it's where it's just like, it's just like this air of like sophistication and just like just beautiful clothes. Mm -hmm. uh, and usually they go all out with their sets and with like everything. It's just like really, really always beautifully done. Um, and lastly, I probably want to go to Chanel show because it gives me an excuse to go to France. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and I feel like, I think they're pretty much known for like the really extravagant um, sets. Mm -hmm. Like it, they always go all out because it's given budget. It's giving, uh -huh. it's giving coins. Right. They, things are getting planned, like set designers, the whole shebang. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of the shows that I just mentioned, it's mostly um, mostly for the experience. Because I feel like that's mm -hmm. what you go to a runway show for a lot of the times too. Number one, first and foremost, of course, is the clothes and the collection, but also it's the experience that comes with right. it. So I feel like something cool, um, you know, like a Chanel show is like very immersive and it's very cool. And a lot of the shows that I mentioned are all have like a very different vibe to them. And it's almost like going to like a really cool exhibition. So I feel like everyone's very intentional. Um, the creatives at those brands are very intentional uh, mm -hmm. in terms of like what emotions they want to invoke in their audience. <clears throat> right, absolutely. Now, where do you see yourself out of 10 years from now? Do you see yourself still working in fashion or do you plan on like venturing into something else? Like what do you see yourself five to 10 years from now? So I most like I'd probably be within fashion or within the realm of like the art industry in general. Um, you know, I've given thought maybe potentially at working like something like a, maybe like an art gallery. Um, mm. Yeah, yeah, like doing like um, art gallery work or doing um, fashion marketing or you know, mm -hmm. things related to that. It's it's no secret. I really, really do. I do love fashion industry. Um, I mm -hmm. love working with clothes. I love empowering people through um, through personal style, and I feel like it's very gratifying work. So continuing to do that, I think, would be would be most likely what where I'll be in the next maybe five ten years for sure. <clears throat> Absolutely. Now looking back at your journey in fashion. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, you mentioned you work you work for Coach. Um, what has been some of the things you learned as far as business, but also as well as navigating, you know, as far as the fashion industry? Mm. That's an excellent question. I feel like now working as an influencer, and I've also had the experience of working in a retail store as an associate. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I've been able to have a very you get a very sober assessment of what fashion what the fashion industry really is, right? Mm -hmm. because I feel like a lot of the times things are overly glamorized, you know? Um, mm. When people think, oh, I want to be a designer, they think of like a, a Karl Lagerfelds of the world and, you know, the extravagance and the models and, the, you know, this, that, and whatnot. Right. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when you're out of the battlefield, right, and you're actually in a store and you're interacting with consumers and you're, you know, observing the way consumers interact with the products. Um, right you really realize that, you know, this is a business, right? right? And that's just like, that's just a very tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of what everything really is, right? And in terms of business, one of the main things I've definitely learned is that for a brand to be successful, it is a huge collaborative process. And mm -hmm. the idea that people have when they start out their careers as a stylist, as a designer, uh, maybe they want to do like uh, you know, visual merchandising. Everybody right. has a very set um, set of ideas and a perspective of what they want and their aesthetic and like very a very um, clear creative vision, you know. Mm -hmm. But with a brand, you know, you really can't be the dictator of everything and orchestrate everything all at once. It's a huge collaboration right. with the buyers. It's a huge collaboration with the visual merchandisers with the store managers that are actually running the business. Um, mm -hmm. 
you know, so while the art is very important, you're also in, it, you know, in a perfect world, we would just be making pretty clothes for the sake of making pretty clothes, right? And for mm -hmm. the art of it. But at the same time, we also need to take into consideration that it is a business that needs to be run. So with that being said, um, for a business to be successful, taking being receptive to feedback on all levels is absolutely uh, critical because everything is just interlinked, right? right? So everything from the from all the way from like the creative director and designer, all the way down to the sales associate, the mm. feedback that you're getting from that lower level is a direct reflection of what your consumer is getting, which is why you're making and designing things in the first place. Mm -hmm. So being receptive to that feedback and understanding what your consumer is liking, what they're not liking, right? Because a lot of the times, um, even at the highest level, we see people kind of lose touch with reality and these do these super crazy conceptual collections that flop and they don't make money. Mm. So mm. we're in the business, we're in the, you know, we're in the business of selling clothes and obviously we want to incorporate the art into it, but, you know, um, selling clothes is also an art, mm -hmm. but then, um, then again, it's that collaboration um, with your visual merchandisers and kind of seeing, uh, you know, what what shoe is selling, what isn't selling, is it comfortable, is it not comfortable? Do people want to see different colorways? Like, you know, regardless of what the aesthetics might be, right? You also need to uh, understand that you need to cater um, to a consumer, which also leads me into the uh, navigating the fashion industry. Um, if you want to be a well-rounded person in the industry, it's absolutely vital that you value other people's perspectives and you're receptive to feedback and that you're genuinely curious about absolutely. the roles that they play and you're willing mm -hmm. to learn about it. Um, even if you're, let's say you're a designer, if you're talking to a visual merchandiser or a buyer or a sales associate, um, you, you're getting all these like little snapshots of different perspectives that help you become a better designer, right? For instance, mm -hmm. if you're speaking to a sales associate and there's a certain design element that you're hearing that consumers are wanting, now I've seen this in, in real life. Getting that little tid, tid, that little tidbit of feedback and incorporating into the design and the sales are skyrocketing, mm -hmm. right? Just because to be a well-rounded artist or person in general, when you are jack of all trades and you understand what each step of the process is like, um, mm -hmm. or at least you're willing to listen about it, then you take these small things into consideration and it makes you overall more successful. But more than anything, um, I feel like being genuinely curious in uh, the people that you meet, um, it cultivates relationships. Right. And those relationships are very important. Um, and it's not because, you know, I'm not saying that you need to develop friendships based on utility because people can feel that. Do you know what I mean? Right. Being genuine and really taking the time to listen to them mm -hmm. and listening a lot more than you speak. So navigating the fashion industry is 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 a tricky is a tricky thing and it's something that I'm continuously learning how to do. But I feel like um, the common denominator for the success of a lot of people is simply cultivating those relationships. Um, being genuinely curious and asking the right questions and listening. Mm -hmm. Yes, I totally agree with that. There was a master class that I uh, took. It was like an online master class a couple years ago, and it was with um, Diane von Furstenberg, DBF. Mm -hmm. And she mm -hmm. talked about as far as with branding, you know, and having your own brand, she said everything you do is at the service of the brand. You right. know, the packaging, the logo, you know, you have to listen to people like how you said, you know, you have to see how people live. You know, that's how you can really understand your target audience. And I think right. that's very, very important, too. But also, too, as well, not only as far as, you know, um, definitely having a team is very, very important. You know, so you get different aspects of feedback, you know, as to how to elevate your brand. But also, too, I think when you sell a product as well people are about like, hey, I have this, you don't, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? So I think definitely having unique things, you know, that that can attract, you know, people say, hey, I want this, this is really, really cool and things like that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like I look at, you know, certain fashion, you know, piece and I'm like, oh, yo, that's really, really cool. Mm -hmm. You know, about the rare romance, you know, handbag. I was like, wow, like the shape is really cool. It's geometric and things like that. It's, it's real expensive, but you know, it's really, really cool. So it's, it's really also having authenticity is very, very important. 
yeah, I think being original is something that has become increasingly rare um, over the years. And we're just seeing this like things being recycled and not in, well, that can be great, but you know, recycling ideas can sometimes just kind of, I think it, uh, it hinders origi originality a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and it can, you know, references can quickly become just, you know, a, something that you can just kind of rely on to get lazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the thing is, like, the uh, with authenticity, like, you know, I like, that's why I said about Alexander McQueen and Guelpe and Mugler, because they had that unique, you know, authenticity, you know, doing unique pieces and things like that, that was really, really cool and out the box, mm -hmm. you know, so I think <clears throat> if, if you stand out some sort of way, that another designer I really like is Sahar Murad, and he's he does a lot of gowns, is very elegant, you know, mm -hmm. what I like about some of his work is that he plays with color, he plays with you know, um, embroidery and, you know, like adding like certain things that can make, make it look opulent, you know, in a dress. So, you know, just having those certain like cool factors playing with texture and color, you know, is very, very cool and important as well. And one of, yeah, one of the, the really important things that I've also learned in navigating this industry um, is also feeling empowered enough to stick to your guns and stick to your gut and creative instincts. Um, right. There's a very, it, and I think it's important to kind of develop a sense of discernment of taking feedback um, and kind of taking what you want and leaving what you don't um, and really understanding right. what your creative vision is and sticking to that. However, mm -hmm. don't become blindsided and just kind of like be like a horse with visors. It's important to hear what people are saying, but mm -hmm. understanding, right. you know, you know what, this does resonate with me. I'm going to apply it and not taking it to heart. And Absolutely. obviously this is an industry where there's a lot of people who also have a very strong creative vision and not exactly. allowing that to really cloud your own vision, rather um, allowing it to enrich or enhance your own creative vision is important. If there's a very fine line between kind of like losing sight of what you want because there's so many external influences so kind of developing that influence, that that uh, that filter to intake all the feedback and intake all mm -hmm. the influences and whatnot, but also remaining true to that DNA of the creative vision that you have. So that's another thing that's really, really important because there's a lot of people I've always had in my ear, um, the way I style certain things. Oh, you sure you want to make that choice? You sure you want to do this or that or the mm -hmm. other? Because I started my career as an influencer in Miami. And Miami, unfortunately, uh, has become, it's, it's not exactly the most socially prog progressive place because it's Florida. Um, and I remember starting out, sometimes I would wear heels or something like that. And people were like, oh, you sure you don't want to wear sneakers or something? Like, this will look really cool. And I'm like, no. You know what I mean? <laughs> Just because right. I stuck to my guns and I was like, this is my creative vision. This is what I want to do. Um, has kind of led me to where I am now. But at the same time, those people around me also give me other great tidbits of advice or other great styling tips. So just kind of know, kind of knowing like what to take and what to leave is is really vital. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, being selective of what advice you take and things like that. You know, right? Because I think right. sometimes yeah. you know people mean well, but sometimes <laughs> it's like you know it can when you hear so many people, you know, in terms of too many perspectives, it starts to confuse you. Like too what? many chefs in the kitchen. Yeah, yeah, too many chefs in the kitchen. Like, you know, is is not there's not a, a balance there, you know, and things like that. You know, you're not it's harder to really discern what advice you take when you're hearing from so many people. You know what I'm saying? So it, it is very is it's also coming down to like selective of who you have in your circle and maintaining mm. that circle of people that can advise you on what to do, you know, and how to navigate and things like that, or how to style certain things like, hey, you know, this would be cool with this to add and you know, things like that. So, you know. I, I think when you have too many people in your ear, it gets, it gets. Mm. Yeah. And I feel like that sense of discernment is a muscle that, you know, is strengthened with use and it comes with maturity. Um, and I right. think that's directly tied to one of my biggest values, which is wisdom. So I think something like, like wisdom is really it's important to keep it at the at a very high esteem in everything that you do, including in this industry, um, and kind of knowing well what what leads you forward and what holds you back, and choosing right. the path that's going to lead you forward. <clears throat> mm -hmm. 
Yeah, absolutely. Most definitely. Last but not least, where can people find you on social media and how people support you? Yes, of course, of course. So um, my username on Instagram is my first name, A-A-R-O-N underscore underscore A-G-U-I-L-A. So it's Aaron underscore underscore Aguila. So I post like reels, um, cool styling videos, a lot of coach content. And then my TikTok is my first name and my last name followed by the number one. So Aaron Aguila one. Um, so that's my TikTok account. Some really cool um, snippets on there. And then also any of the coach social medias, um, I'm tagged in most of the things so you'll probably see me on some uh some interesting videos in there too mm, yeah that's really cool well thank you so much Aaron, for jumping on the show um, I, love, I love what you're doing as far as with coach i ran into you on tiktok and i was like mm -hmm. you no know, i like how you're you know talking about the handbags but also different ways of styling them so it's really cool also that you're into handbags and accessories you know like i said me and my mom love handbags i love also love book bags and sneakers and things like there you that go. So, um you know i really enjoyed our conversation so thank you so much thank you so much for having me i really, really appreciate you reaching out yes absolutely take care okay bye bye thank you hello everyone thank you all so much for watching please like comment share and subscribe to the channel be sure to click the bells for notifications also follow me on social media platforms and be on the lookout for more interviews involving fashion style and fashion history take care and stay stylish